Uh, now, two things I'm great at, uh, speaking quietly and sweating profusely. So this, this room right now is an absolute boon for me. Now, what I want to do in the next 45 minutes is to look at the development of what Hans Kohn, uh, who uh, Frank mentioned earlier, defined as bad or Eastern or ethnic nationalism. Uh, in particular, I want to look at the development of German nationalism. Uh, I want to dig a little deeper into its historical specificity, its trajectory, and the ideas of what it is to be German that emerge in the course of its development. Um, but before that, I'm going to look a little at the figure some hold responsible for the romantic turn of nationalism. In some ways, in some ways the romantic origins of nationalism. And I'm talking about uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, of course, uh, the figure who arguably influenced German intellectuals and nationalists more than any other outside uh, German lands, that is. Uh, I don't want to suggest, in case there are any German nationalists here, and unfortunately no, uh, no one looks quite old enough, that there is any source of German nationalism other than the sheer effing brilliance of the Germans themselves. Anyway, why is Rousseau important? Uh, because his work indicates, I think, how nationalism emerges out of the Enlightenment itself. Uh, it emerges in Rousseau, I think you can see it emerging in Rousseau, as a conscious project. Indeed, I would argue that it emerges out of the Enlightenment almost as a response to some of the problems posed by both the Enlightenment and, I think, and the emergent, uh, and emergent and modern uh, institutions of the state. Now, Rousseau is seen by many as a critic of the Enlightenment, and it's true that in his first and second discourses on the sciences and the arts and on inequality, he does weigh in against what he sees as the emerging, uh, sees as emerging modern society, uh, dominated as far as he's concerned by love of uh, money, which is just a sign and not the thing itself, as he constantly reminds people. Uh, he also complains that it's dominated by enfeebling dependency on the thoughts and opinions of others. And above all, he, he blames it on cultivating the worst of man, a self-loving character, powdered and puffed with vanity, who thinks everything of himself and nothing of others. Um, yet, uh, hold on, that's not a uh, meaningful pause, it's just me losing my place. <laughs> yet, what I want to... Yet what I want to draw attention to is that Rousseau uh, doesn't blame uh, the problems of modernity on too much reason. Uh, he doesn't blame all this on the freeing up of people to govern themselves rather than languish under the impressive thumb of, of church and landed lord. Uh, he thinks reason is great. He thinks reason is imperative. Uh, his most famous work, I would argue, The Social Contract, is an entirely rational attempt uh, to ground the authority of government and the state on the people. Indeed, the people are sovereign. Uh, that is the equation he makes. It is the statement of popular sovereignty. So he, um, he probably goes beyond the, mo the early modern, early Enlightenment political philosophies of Hugo Grotius, writing in the midst of the uh, Dutch Revolt, and Thomas Hobbes, writing amidst the English Civil War, to envision the grounds for a self-determining republic ahead of the French Revolution. So he thinks reason is great. He's a massive fan of rational and therefore non uh, uh, He's a massive fan of a rational and therefore non-divine conception of a republican form of statehood. But, and this is Rousseau's problem throughout his work, reason is not enough. At the level of the individual, it is not enough to make him act as he knows he ought to. Uh, something Rousseau's confessions, uh, his famous autobiography, plays on. He knows that he shouldn't be hiding under this arch, looking at these young women and masturbating frantically. But there he is, paying a very vigorous homage to, uh, to, to Onan. That is a meaningful pause, actually. <laughs> and at the level of the imagined republic, reason, civic procedure is not enough. Citizens can know the laws, they can know right even, yet there won't be enough, if you like, to commit them to the common good. It won't be enough in and of itself to allow them to overcome their particular interests, to allow them to overcome their self-interest, and to see things, as he sees it, from the perspective of the whole, to align themselves with the general will. Reason, a rational, uh, a rational constitu constitutional republic, won't be enough to compel citizens to act according to one's idea of what one ought to do, which is to act on the maximal law that, maximal law that reason demonstrates should become a universal law. Now, Kant's ethics, uh, I think, is all there in Rousseau. Uh, this is not an abstract problem. It is also a response to social transform transformations wrought before Rousseau's eyes. The old pre-political ties that bound people together in small or smallish feudal locales as lords, servants, members of guilds, peasants and so on, are no longer quite as binding as they used to be. People are becoming freer 
and they're also becoming ungrounded. They're also becoming uprooted. The older social relations are being undone. They're being torn asunder, if you like, by social and economic forces that are yet to acquire their 19th century clarity. Still, as Rousseau sees it, there is a new type of individual in the ascendant, um, despite, the, despite the persistence of monarchy in its absolutist form. And that, as he sees it, is the bourgeois. This is the new individual. This is the self-loving, acquisitive hypocrite who populates Rousseau's writings. He is unrooted and unrooting. He has contractual obligations, but he has very few moral duties. He is loyal to his own self-advancement, but he is loyal to nothing beyond that. He is rational, but he, acts, he often acts contrary to moral reason. This, for Rousseau, is the type of person, the type of individual that is gaining ascendancy. And he is transnational. He's perhaps even cosmopolitan. As Rousseau puts it in his 7072 uh, book, considerations on the government of Poland and on its projected reformation, uh, given that title, you can imagine that Rousseau was confident enough in his own popular image to sell uh, books on, uh, on the basis of his name rather than titles. Anyway, as he puts it there, there are no Frenchmen, there are no Germans, Spaniards or Englishmen anymore. They are all merely European. And for European, we can read egocentric, acquisitive, bourgeois. And just to ram it home, Rousseau writes, provided they find money to steal and women to corrupt, they are at home in any country. So there you have one of the very first portraits of an EU official. That's not, that's, that's not even true, that's not true, that's not true. Now, Rousseau is hamming it up a bit. There's nothing he likes better than having a go at the hated bourgeois, the intellectual patrons, the philosophers, the Lumieres. But the point he's making is that in the absence of traditional sources of moral authority, reason alone is not enough to generate moral conduct among citizens. And this is why, in a, in, in, in a recurring sort of triadic formulation that recurs throughout his great cycle of works in the early, in the early 1760s, uh, Julie, uh, Emile, uh, The Social Contract, uh, there he argues that through reason, we can know the good. Through, will, through our will, we can uh, follow the good. But it's through our conscience that we learn to love the good. And it's this, this love of the good, this inner voice that speaks on behalf of the right thing to do that Rousseau urges us to cultivate. And this is where nationalism, or more accurately, patriotism, comes in. New constitutions are all very well. They can be as rational and republican as he dreams of them being. But as he puts it, no constitution will ever be good and solid unless the law rules the citizens' hearts. Patriotism, if you like, emerges as a solution to a problem. It emerges as a solution to the, uh, to the inability of reason by itself to inspire people to be committed to a republic, to be committed to civic virtue. <coughs> Um, it emerges, if you like, as the sentimental glue that will bind people together. It is this kind of pre-political adhesive to be found, as Rousseau, as Rousseau sees it in the case of Poland, among Poles and their survival, their brave survival, in spite of their neighbours' constant aggression. For Rousseau, patriotism, if you like, is to the state what conscience is to the individual. It is the means through which a citizen or subject comes to love, not simply one's country or territory, as it's kind of rather more debased forms have it, as if uh, uh, love of uh, one's fatherland is somehow sort of um, identified with love of a particular piece of scenery or a particular kind of locale. No, he means it's also the lo it's love of the laws and constitution of the territorial state itself. Rousseau even defines it as such. Patriotism means love of fatherland, that is to say, love of the laws and of freedom. Yet, is, yet this love, it's not a given, it's not something that's just got, simply going to arise uh, without any cultivation from the soil itself. Um, this love of the law, which is more than knowledge of the law, has to be cultivated. The state has to move its citizens' hearts. And Rousseau, like so many others, looks to Greco-Roman models for inspiration. He talks of public ceremonies that the, uh, that the Greeks used to hold. He talks of solemn spectacles, telling the great tales of the nation. Obviously, he puts it, raising uh, pole souls to the level of the ancients. With Sparta, no doubt in mind, he says each citizen ought to be a soldier by duty, none by profession, because their love of the whole will trump their particular interests, because their love for the laws of the fatherland means they'll have a willingness to fight and die for that love, for those beloved laws and for those who, are, who have, bound and continue, have been bound by them and continue to be sort of bound by them. And of course he talks about education. It is education, he writes, that gives the soul national form and so directs their tastes and opinions that they will be patriotic by inclination, passion, necessity. Every true Republican drank love of fatherland, that is to say love of the laws and of freedom with his mother's milk.
Now, this merger of sort of uh, patriotism and this uh, ideal of a kind of civic nationalism, this comes to a head, of course, not in Poland. Uh, Rousseau's recommendations uh, to, 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 to the Polish nobles uh, didn't go down too well. It's the, the emancipation of serfs and so on. Um, Rousseau's um, recommendations, of course, come to a head or are realised properly, I think, in the French Revolution. Uh, where it is not enough that the new republican order is, is a seeming triumph of reason, it must also be loved. Hence the schemes for patri patriotic education and so forth, which are put forth by uh, various French revolutionaries. I think no wonder uh, the, the great sociologist Emile Durkheim noted of the French Revolution that things purely secular in nature became transformed into sacred things. These were the fatherland, liberty, reason. A religion tended to become established which had its dogmas, symbols, altars and feasts. So in the French Revolution, we can see the role of patriotism, of encouraging the people, which is used interchangeably in Rousseau's work with nation, to love not, say, France as a territorial entity, but the French Republic, its constitution, its rights, its liberties, its laws. In a sense, then, there really was a kind of secular, uh, sorry, a sacralization, a, a sacralization of the secular, as Durkheim said, it, a passion for reason. But at the same time, there was no doubt that the Republic, its constitution, was also very much the work of men, that the laws were the work of people's reason, and that the people, at least formally, were sovereign. I say this because I think the source of the so-called bad nationalism, which come to, comes to uh, the fore in Germany, the strain of nationalism that would become a problem, turns the fatherland, turns the object of citizens' love into something almost supra-rational, something that is not and no longer the work of men so much as the product, if you like, of some sort of superhuman historical destiny. In this sense, patriotism and nationalism lose their rational aspect. The nationalist nation-building project ceases to be something that people do for themselves, and it becomes something that is done almost to them, that works itself out according to its own sort of superhuman laws of development. And this, I think, is what happens in Germany, or the lands we now know of as Germany. Um, the key figure, as, 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 as Frank intimated, but he also kind of criticised this contention, the key figure, at least initially, is, of course, uh, the philosopher comes sort of as the decision, uh, Johann Gottfried Herder. Uh, born in 1744 in, in Prussia uh, to a school teacher and a church warden, uh, he manages to get into the University of Konigsberg, uh, where he meets and becomes friends with Immanuel Kant. He also spends a short time in Paris in his mid-twenties where he meets uh, Diderot and d'Alembert, uh, the, uh, the famous encyclopedists. Uh, and I'm, I'm telling you this not because I want to demonstrate my love of Wikipedia, it's because <laughs> I want to emphasise the extent to which Herder, like Rousseau, who was a great influence, was of the Enlightenment. And the two areas in which he made his name testify to that in his philosophy of history and related to that his philosophy of language. That is, he was interested intellectually, I think, in the reasons for historical differences between peoples and the contemporaneous differences between peoples. In terms of history, Herder's central contention was that each age, each age dominated by political and cultural power, builds on the achievements of the past. Uh, so the ancient Greeks build on the achievements of the Phoenicians, who in turn build on the achievements of the Egyptians and so on. But he also contends that each people, thanks, as he puts it, to God, climate and stage of world development, constitutes a distinct whole unto itself. So the Romans didn't just appropriate aspects of Greek culture, they simultaneously made them Roman. They ceased to be, they became Roman. And this is because each age and each people, thanks as uh, Herder puts it, to, uh, of course, to climate and stage of world development and so on, had a particular view of the good life. It had a particular, each age that has a particular idea of the meaning and purpose of individual and social activity. Each age, that is, has its own particular ends, a particular distinct moral and social framework to which the, to which the material, uh, to the material of another age, religion, political institutions and so on were subject. As he puts it in his Another Philosophy of History, every nation has a centre of happiness within itself, as every ball has its centre of gravity. And in arguing this, in rationally inquiring into the nature of historical development and difference, he, goes a great, he, he obviously goes against that great tenet of enlightenment, namely universal progress. Because he's effectively saying that each age has its own moral code, be it the chivalric ideal of medieval times or the warrior ethic of Sparta. Uh, and because of this, you can't really compare these different ages because they don't share a common criteria of judgment. They have their own internal criteria of judgment, their own internal standard, their own internal uh, centre of happiness, their own essence which works itself out and eventually 
wears itself down as each age and people, each age and each people declines and falls. And in his philosophy of language, he inquires, as so many others were doing in, in Europe at this point, into the origin and development of different languages. In so doing, he further grounds the distinction and difference between peoples in terms of their... Uh, he, he grounds the difference between peoples in terms of their respective languages. Indeed, a national people, a national volk, he argues, are constituted by the linguistic content that historically and naturally develops within and through individual speakers. A literary and folk heritage, therefore, it, it, it grounds a people. And I'd, suge I'd suggest, and I think this is Darren Rooster in Herder, it also determines them. And this, I think, is the problem with Herder, and the first indication that in Germany, um, a notion of nationhood, a notion of patriotism, will take on a different form. Uh, so the problem is not his historical relativism, which, as it happens, um, I think is a decent attempt to reckon with the facts of historical difference. Uh, in fact, by concentrating on the essence of an age, by looking for the internal forces which give each age its, its shape, its form, he paves the way for the deeper historical understanding of someone like Hegel and later still Marx. And it's not his linguistic proto-nationalism that's the problem. Herder is far from alone in turning to language as the possible source and repository of the ties that bind a people. Indeed, language is that in which uh, a people's spiritual being is caught, um, is, is, is a preoccupation throughout Europe at this point. Um, you know, across Europe and throughout the kind of the broader romantic movement, there was a turn towards the language of a people, to the language of a folk. There are kind of myriad explorations and excavations of literary traditions which are reconfigured as national pasts. You know, it's at this point that something like Beowulf becomes a kind of a foundational text for the English tradition, of, of English literary tradition. Uh, there are attempts to revive and promote particular languages, which are often, you know, tiny minority languages, languages spoken by a minority, but an attempt to revive and cultivate them as potentially national languages. You know, at th this point you get, well, actually, Gaelic in Ireland was, was probably actually the, the most popular and uh, mass spoken of, of, of the, of the language, languages which are being cultivated at that point as a language of the people. Uh, in, 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 in France, you get the same thing. At the time of the revolution, only between 10 and 20% of the population spoke French. But there was an attempt to uh, cultivate a national language because it was considered to be, to, to be important to capture something about a people, to tie people together. Uh, in fact, most interesting of all, I think, is the, is the cultural turn towards the language and life of the people, the attempt to find what uh, Frank earlier characterised as the pre-political cohesion uh, that I think the kind of atom atomising tendencies of uh, early modernisation threaten. And I think you can see this in one of the most important documents of English Romanticism. I think that's the preface to Wordsworth and Coleridge's Lyrical Ballads. There, Wordsworth explains that he was attempting to express, to capture in his poems, the real language of men, to capture their diction, to capture their verbal sentiment. That is, he was seeking his muse, if you like, in what he considered to be kind of the authentic or true being of English people. And in so doing, he was almost conjuring them up before him. He was almost conjuring up uh, a, a real English people. And of course, you can see it almost most naffly and most spectacularly, I think, in, in Walter Scott, who simultaneously sought to preserve and sort of memorialise uh, both Scotland's history. Uh, think of Waverley or to 60 years since and its evocation of the Highland, Highlanders and their dialect. Uh, so successful was Scott that Scotland can sometimes feel like Walter Scotland. You know, you catch a train to Edinburgh today, Edinburgh to today. You, can, uh, you end up at Waverley Station, uh, which you exit to be confronted by that huge Gothic tribute to, to Walter Scott. And just to finish today, you can catch the heart of Midlothian, which is no longer a book or a prison, but a football team. You can't move for the kind of cultural nationalistic efforts of a writer who knows Scott reads anymore and many loathe. And they loathe him, of course, because he was, a, he was actually a unionist and a conservative. No, the problem with Herder is, 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 is neither kind of the implicit historical relativism nor the attempt to find the spirit of the people in language. Uh, rather, I think it's that he turns people into the opposite or starts to turn people into the opposite of what they were for Rousseau or Kant and what they were to be for the French revolutionaries. That is, in Herder's hands, they are no longer potentially autonomous individuals capable of constituting a civic nationalism. Uh, they're barely capable of constituting a new language. No, they're little more than vehicles for the unfolding of spiritual, largely linguistic forces beyond their control. 
at one point in his philosophy of history, which he is written actually in 1774, uh, he likens humans to ants working according to an unfathomable design. At another point, he writes that you humans have always been just a small blind instrument used against your will. And this, I think, infects, infects and, uh, and inflects uh, his incipient idea of nationhood. It is not something people consciously struggle for in the work of Herder, in the interests of gaining uh, or attaining a greater degree of self-government. Uh, nationalism is simply not a project, a conscious project, in the way it was for someone like Rousseau. It is not something people do. Rather, he conjures nationalism up as something more like fate. Uh, a nation's realisation is the work, at best, I think, of great demigodish men uh, who work as the instruments of history, and at worst, as some kind of form of semi-blind providence. Likewise, language, it is the bearer of, of a people's spiritual being. It constitutes a people. It is language doing all this. Uh, it, it, it is not spoken, it's so much as it speaks people. And I think all of this culminates crucially in a very specific redefinition of freedom, a redefinition that will become hugely influential as German nationalism develops. Because Herder does, not write, it's, Herder does write of freedom, but it's not an idea of self-determination or self-government of an individual or a people making the law for themselves. Rather, in Herder, to be free is to be free to develop according to the law of one's own nature, and since peoples and nations also have their own distinct particular law of development, their own centre of happiness, their own ethno-linguistic spirit, if you like, to be, free, to be a free people is to be free to develop, to develop according to that law of, uh, 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 that law of, kind of uh, ethno-language, according to the, kind of the, uh, uh, the, spiritu the spiritual being which is uh, carried and transmitted through language. Uh, so freedom is not to be free to govern oneself, but is, it is to be free to be governed by some sort of external force. Now, Herder was not a German nationalist, uh, as it happened. He, he's too early. You know, I don't, I don't know. That's a really simplistic definite, uh, explanation as to why. Um, but he wasn't. Uh, as it happened, I think, he, like the rest of uh, uh, Germany's small but uh, highly advanced uh, intellectual, cultural elite from Goethe to Schelling, from Kant to Hegel, all welcomed and supported the French, Re French Revolution, at least, at least uh, initially. Uh, they saw it as kind of the herald of a new dawn. Um, uh, I, in fact, the, the, I think the reason why Herder's thinking, and to an extent Hegel's too, seemed simultaneously to probe more deeply into, and yet simultaneously mythologize historical development was not inchoate German nationalism, but that history was still not really something that people made in the, in, in the, lands, in, in, in the German lands at this point in the late 18th century. Um, talk of popular sovereignty, which Hegel dismissed as a, as a wild idea of the people, uh, was effectively translated into something like a Volksgeist in Germany. Uh, it was spirit rather than uh, some, some more kind of concrete form of subjectivity. Uh, which makes sense, because in the 1790s in Germany, it was a socially, and economically and culturally backward uh, set of lands. Uh, as Georg Lukács described it, it consisted of modernised feudalism, ruled over by hundreds of petty princes. Uh, if political freedom in, this, in, in, in the manner of the French Revolution was to be won in a potentially unified Germany, it was difficult to see how. Uh, hence the tendency, if you like, to fall back on this kind of mythological German spirit rather than an actual German people. Uh, so it's, it, it's kind of this mythical kind of Volksgeist that will liberate and unify, not actual people. Hence also, I think, the tendency to mythologise the prospective German state less as the work of men according to rational or legal principles and to turn, it to, to turn it into something else, to turn it into the work of some particularly, specifically German nature and destiny. Um, now, the key, event has been, uh, the key event here, as has been noted, uh, which was to turn Herder's intimations of, a unique, of unique national laws of development into something approaching German nationalism, was, of course, the French Revolution and the subsequent uh, Napoleonic conquest of, uh, of, of German lands in 1806. Uh, for while the French Revolution was initially greeted enthusiastically, its descent uh, and the rise of Napoleon and its brand of French come Roman Republican expansion uh, started to prompt not revolutionary nationalism in Germany, but something more like chauvinism. 
so in the late 1790s in, in Deutsche Grosse, uh, Friedrich Schiller argued that it was not the French, but the Germans who were the universal people and whose mission it was to fulfill in themselves universal mankind and to unite in a wreath the most beautiful flowers of all peoples. Good luck with that, Friedrich. The French Republic's claim to universality and its self-styled role as the bearer of enlightenment had a further effect on German nationalism. Um, it intensified its counter-enlightenment tendencies uh, to French Enlightenment universality uh, in, 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 in the lands of Germany. Uh, it, was, it, it was counterposed to German uniqueness. To French reason, there was counterposed intuition and passion. And crucially, I think, to popular autonomy, it counterposed a kind of volkish authenticity. Now, as I say, Napoleon's defeat of Prussia, the last standing and most powerful of the German states in, in 1806, uh, intensified uh, th th this kind of uh, chauvinistic, particular, particularistic reaction on the part of uh, Germany. Uh, the greatness of German lands was almost asserted in its palpable absence. Uh, the likes of Ernst Moritz Arndt, a historian and a poet, came to the fore. In opposition, as he sought to the womanly French, you might have had a point, he defended, defined and asserted the uniqueness of the Germans. We have not been bastardised by foreign peoples, he wrote. Uh, we have not become half-breeds. The Germans, more than many other peoples, have remained in their native state of purity. Um, then, of course, there was my favourite German nationalist emerging in the, in, in the 1810s, Friedrich Ludwig Jahn, who, so angered was he by the German conquest, sought to revitalise the yet-to-be German nation through the power of gymnastics. <laughs> there was also a considerable intensification of interest and actually probably the foundation of, of, of the discipline of, of philology. Um, with two brothers leading the charge, uh, uh, Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, uh, the, Grimm uh, the brothers Grimm in the 1810s. And they were intent on excavating the German folkloric tradition because it seemed to consolidate a sense of German uniqueness, that there was this kind of age-old oral tradition which carried within it the German spirit and would, and, and would fortify Germans today. So in, 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 in Jacob's own words, their fairy tales, uh, Jacob Grimm's own words, their fairy tales faithfully rested from the mouths of the Volk, uh, conveying a Germany of villages, farmland and forest, of supreme kings and a, and a strictly hierarchical society. Uh, he argued that they, these tales derived their strength from the soil of the fatherland. Um, what he neglected uh, to admit was that the principal source of, uh, uh, of, of Grimm's tales was not an old peasant woman, but the wife of an old Prussian politician, and worse still, whose family were French. Still, authenticity, the truth of Germanic nature, the spiritual reality of Germania, uh, was the aim of the tales. It wasn't their origin. The brothers Grimm wanted to preserve and propagate this Volkish spirit in the interests of this kind of rather more sort of mythologized spiritual nation. Uh, at this point, there's also a renewed focus on Tacitus's first century volume, Germania, uh, which was conveniently, I think, rediscovered during the reign of Frederick the Great in, in the 15th century. Now, it's basically, it almost reads as kind of German nationalist erotica. Uh, it relates the story of the Romans, the, the Romans' defeat to a German tribe. Uh, Tacitus describes them as being fierce, of having blue eyes, of, uh, of tawny hair, uh, huge bodies. They, they, they're, profoundly, they're profoundly virtuous. He says, no one laughs off vice. And most of important of all, there's no intermingling. And all this, with others, with others, among themselves, they were all at it. And all this is key to some aboriginal, he says, aborig aboriginal notion of Germanness. Now, the key work, I think, in, 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 the, in, in the early 19th century, uh, in, the, in the establishment of German nationalism, is, is uh, Johann Gottlieb Fichte's Addresses to the German Nation. Um, it's the product of a 14-week lecture course delivered in Berlin in 1807. So that's a year after, after Prussia fell to Napoleon at the Battle of Vienna. And this context, I think, is hugely important. Uh, Fichte, uh, Fichte, alongside Hegel, is probably the leading German philosopher of the day. Uh, and he's effectively issuing a call to arms to that which does not yet exist, the German nation. Um, and under an occupying army at threat, I guess, from Prussia's own spies, you know, Fischer's actually taking a huge risk delivering a, a public lecture in this context. Uh, and he makes this clear in his introduction when, it, when he makes an appeal um, against censorship. He wants, to be able to free, he wants to be able to be free to just to be able to talk about these things. Um, so, you know, it, it's a really interesting, fascinating kind of torn document. Um, and it also explains why his barbs against France are so veiled. So he writes, another alien purpose, he writes, has been imposed upon us by an external power. He doesn't name France. 
but it's there. Uh, we've become, he puts it, an appendage of a foreign life. Um, and as I say, it's a call to arms to this kind of yet-to-be German nation. Uh, Fichte wants almost to forge it from, if not nothing, then I think certainly very little. Um, after all, where, apart from in the minds of his fellow intellectuals, conjuring up and creating the, this kind of Volk, appear, appealing to this spirit, is this popular nationalism to be found? And in the absence of any actual sort of incipient revolutionary nationalist movement, uh, it, it gives um, Fichte's kind of neo-Kantian uh, thinking an explicitly voluntarist hue. It's all about a sheer will, a sheer will. I think that's a kind of a, a, a telling formulation. Uh, but he knows talk of this kind of self-positing an image of the ideal moral come national order and realising it, it just through a sheer act of kind of subjective will is not enough. So he spends a major part of the early lectures talking about the importance of education, uh, a, a specifically German national education. I think all teachers in this room should take note because he says the function of this education, the function of, of a German national education, is to annihilate any trace of free will. <laughs> children, he said, children and young people should be cultivated in such a way that they will, of inner necessity, will the emergence uh, of, of, of a specifically German future, a German kind of spiritual being. Yet despite Fichte's voluntarism, despite his kind of uh, spec spectacular subjective idealism, in which he's almost wanting just to, to will the nation into existence, just for a sheer kind of uh, uh, act of imagining it, um, despite his kind of commitment to uh, a future which you can simply imagine into being, he, like, he like, um, like Herder himself, falls back ultimately on and into this rather sort of fatalistic concept of language and Germanness. He admits, that, he admits that in everyday usage, people do evolve a language, particularly as regarding as he puts it, sensory ideas, uh, names and descriptions of things we see and so on. You know, that kind of makes, kind of makes sense. Uh, you, you know, a kettle won't have existed for, the, uh, for those fellows who were fighting the Romans. You know, that, that, that's to be a new, new, new word. That's not a particularly sophisticated example of what, uh, uh, of what Fisch is saying. Uh, but that is not the case for what he calls suprasensory ideas, uh, those concepts that reference the non-material, the, uh, the spiritual life of a people. These, he argues, are caught and transmitted through language. And this is key. Language here, this carrier of our spiritual, of German spiritual being, their essence, determines, determines who they are. We don't express our non-material ideas and knowledge using language. That knowledge, that language, as he puts it, and he does say that it speaks us. Furthermore, that language constitutes us. The language is doing everything here. Constitutes us as a national people. He writes the totality of, of men living with each other in society, constantly reproducing themselves spiritually and physically, the whole ruled by the particular law of development of the divine. And in the case of the German language, what speaks through Fichte and his fellows, what, what divine law of spiritual development creates and drives the Germans, what is transmitted is the spiritual life of that lost Aboriginal tribe of Nordsmen, Nordsmen and, 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 and Germans, those who courageously defied the Romans despite the promise of, uh, of some form of Republican citizenship, just as today's contemporary Germans should have and could defy the French despite the, pos uh, despite the promise of French Republican citizenship. He writes, freedom meant for this ancient tribe that they remained German, that they conducted their affairs independently, originally, according to their own spirit, developing this onward and cultivating this independence in their descendants. Slavery meant for them all the blessings offered to them by the Romans, for in accepting them, they would have had to become something other than Germans, they would have become half Roman. They presumed... Fisch saying that uh, this ancient tribe of Germans presumed it to be self-evident that anyone would rather die than become this and that a true German could only wish to live as a German, remaining so and bringing his own up in like manner. And I, I think that's a, that's a key statement. Freedom meant for them that they remained German, that they conducted their affairs independently, originally, according to their own spirit. Once again, I think this time in explicit nationalist form, we have a development of this Herderian notion of freedom. It is not the freedom to govern oneself according to a collectively consented to or agreed upon 
constitutional laws. It's not, it's not a political form of freedom. It is not the freedom of self-determination which has been articulated here. Rather, it is the freedom of a people to express their spiritual being, to allow their spiritual being. It is a freedom to allow their spiritual being to be expressed. What's more, in Fichte, this linguistically carried spiritual uniqueness sets the Germans apart precisely because of its purity, precisely because the Germans are so inherently brave and, and resolute that they resisted conquest all those centuries ago, and, the and they therefore resisted any kind of resulting impurity of being half Roman, unlike the effeminate French or the mongrel English. The Germans' languages are, uh, aren't peppered or intermingled with the languages of successive conquerors. So in Herder, nations were fated to rise and fall according to the laws of spiritual, devel in, sp according to the laws of spiritual development. Um, after the French Revolution, after the Napoleonic conquest of the German lands, this has changed. In Fichte, one nation becomes destined to rise according to the laws of spiritual development. German unity is not a conscious project. It is destiny now. It's not fate. It's destiny. As the Germans once were, so they shall be again, providing they are free to become what they are and always were. And I think all that is specifically retrograde and, uh, and, and, and which is developed during the period of German, uh, of, of the development of German nationalism during the 19th century is there in Fischer's addresses. It is not a, it, 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 nationhood is not something that a people does. It is not something that, uh, that they constitute for themselves. It is done to them. If the French Revolution promises something democratic, German unification promises something rather more authoritarian. Enlightenment, enlightenment sounding terms are almost turned into their opposites in, in, in the context of German nationalism. We've seen this with freedom, the rallying cry of a radical democratic nationalism becomes the freedom to simply become what the laws of spiritual linguistic development destines a people to be, in this case superior in mind and body. And univer universalism becomes particularist. Even patriotism, the great love of one's fatherland, the love that is of the laws and constitution constantly drawn up and fought for by generations of one's fellow citizens, um, that becomes a love simply of some spiritually ordained authority, some supreme manifestation of Germanness, an iron chancellor perhaps, or an emperor. How long have I got now? Um, ten minutes. Uh, I don't want to suggest that this, that, uh, this was the only kind of, uh, that this peculiar strain of, of cultural nationalism was the only strain of nationalism at work in 19th century Germany. Uh, some resisted, such as the poet uh, Heinrich Heine, who, as Isaiah, Isaiah Lin, uh, Berlin put it in his note on nationalism, um, Heine warned the French in 1832 that one fine day their German neighbours, fired by a terrible combination of absolutist metaphysics, historical memories and resentments, fanaticism and savage strength and fury, would fall upon them and would destroy the great monuments of Western civilization. Uh, there was also a kind of, there was also a radical democratic tradition as well, uh, certainly emerging after Napoleon's defeat in 1813-14, and they were arguing for liberal freedoms. And I think, you know, Karl Marx is initially part of this, the, uh, this movement, you know, so he's pushing for press freedom and so on. So not everyone is enthralled to this kind of peculiar strain of mystified uh, national messianism. Uh, and as the uh, 19th century progresses, as Germans' bourgeoisie starts to awaken politically, there is a push uh, for rather kind of more prosaic forms of, of, of national unity, a customs union uh, it, uh, during the 1820s and 1830s. Uh, so we see a more rational, liberal, inclined nationalism emerge, culminating in a, in a brutal but brutally crushed attempted revolution in 1848 in, uh, 1848 in Berlin. Um, I feel like that was almost like a natural end, but it's not. Uh, but that spiritual rationalist form of nationalism, which Germany is destined to realise its spiritual being, its spiritual superiority, uh, complete with a kind of talk of will, of Volksgeist, of purity, of Germania, I think that kind of remains dominant. I think it's there in Nietzsche's wild Aryan beasts realising their superiority as Ubermenschen. And it's certainly there, and I think, in the Germanophile Englishman, Houston Stuart Chamberlain's 1899 book, Foundations of the 19th Century, because it's there that he drew on uh, Count de, uh, de Gobineau, is that how you pronounce his name? His famous racial justification for inequality. 
uh, and he asserts that Aryan Nordic Teutonic uh, racial su uh, superiority is evident, uh, much to German Emperor Wilhelm II's delight. A work of the highest importance, he said. And while the metaphysical aspects of German nationalism are not a massively motivating factor for Otto von Bismarck, certainly not uh, as motivating, I think, as boiled eggs of which ate 12 a day, mm -hmm. the fact... I think it's the fact that a Prussian monarchy-loving Junker who proudly proclaimed, I'm not a Democrat, and uh, only through force of will, or blood and iron, as he puts it, can one get things done. I think that indicates the absence of even a kind of moderate, uh, uh, well, uh, a majorly moderate liberalism in, 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 in German nationalism. Uh, internal and external pressures contribute to the intensification, I think, of this form of nationalism as a spiritual sometimes racial destiny during the long 19th century, up until, I think, the First World War. Uh, internally, I think there's a need to shore up these new national institutions before, certainly after 1871, these new national institutions before an increasingly powerful socialist movement. Uh, the first international, I think, is established in 1861 and 62. And in, eight, and in the 1880s and 1890s, at the same time as the United Germany is now becoming imperial power, there's also a great wave of immigration which pushes the fear of, a, uh, of, of diluting ethnic purity to the fore. In many ways, for Germany then, it's not the Nazis that are the culmination of this peculiar strain of nationalism as the freedom for Germany to realise its spiritual essence. I think it's the First World War. Uh, because it's there that you kind of have this, uh, the, 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 the opportunity to, re to, to, um, to, to realise this mythical moment of decision, if you like, this moment when the nation is to be resolute, when it affirms its spiritual destiny. And I think you can see that most spectacularly in Max Weber, a man who saw the kind of mo modern post-Reformation, enlightened rationalisation, as he puts it, of the world as its disenchantment. Because on the eve of the war, he embraces German nationalism precisely because he sees it as a chance for spiritual renewal, for the re-enchantment of the world under the auspices of that most spiritual of nations, Germany. Uh, after the First World War, I think it's difficult to imagine the rise of National Socialism and Hitler without, without the preceding peculiar development of German nationalism in the preceding uh, 100 years. Uh, Fichte and, and Nietzsche become Hitler's philosophers in arms, and in Hitler and Rosenberg's hands, the ethno linguistic purity and destiny of Germans becomes thoroughly racialized and ten times more aggressive in the face, as they put it, of the Jewish Marxist teachings of Bolshevism and what it threatened, which was more democracy and more internationalism. But it's also there in its more metaphysical, uh, less racially inflected forms, I think in both Carl Schmitt and especially Martin Heidegger. Now, I don't want to talk about Heidegger in any special detail, I don't think anyone does, but just two things I draw attention to. The first is that... Um, I think what makes Heidegger so unique is actually his use of language. Um, I think he repurposes an everyday German for philosophical ends. Uh, I think he's uh, almost determined to reveal, as he sees it, these kind of deep, largely obscured meanings and forces that are almost inherent in the German language, which only need to be kind of uh, unleashed. The being of beings, if you like, carried linguistically, but forgotten and concealed, as he put it, by Western metaphysics. Uh, by that, he means reason, really. Um, that is our task, I think, as Heidegger sees it, to be. He doesn't say Germany at any point in Being in Time, which is written in, I think it's published in 1927. Um, he doesn't say Germany particularly, uh, and he certainly doesn't uh, indulge in any kind of open endorsement of German nationalism, let alone the Nazis, because they, they weren't by particular force, not until the 1930s. But he does talk of, uh, of destiny. He does talk of a kind of community's destiny. It's all of this kind of, it's a very veiled form, but I think it's there. It's still persistent, this kind of, uh, th th this uh, mythologized, mythified um, spirit of the, uh, German spirit, which, is, uh, which just needs to be kind of unleashed and will make over the world. Likewise, what he hates, or rather who he hates, wool Jewry, uh, Jews, he hates, as the black notebooks makes clear, because they uproot, as he puts it, beings from being. Uh, that is, Jews wrest beings from the largely, I think, largely linguistic source of who they really are, of who people really are, their beings of being. Again, it's, it, it, Heidegger's anti-Semitism can be banal, but often it's, it's, it, it's, it's kind of highfalutin and elevated. Uh, you know, it takes anti-Semitism, elevates it almost to like a metaphysical art form. And I say that's nearly that. I would say that German nationalism as national consciousness had kind of breathed, uh, uh, breathed its last farcical breath with the Second World War. Its terms by then racial and messianic were rejected. Its results, authoritarian and, and uh, the systematic extermination of undesirable, uh, impure elements were rightly seen as morally revolting. Uh, 
There is no legacy of German nationalism, I think, for nationalism, uh, because the specific conditions in which it developed no longer hold or held. Um, after 1945, I think to insist on the ethnic superiority of a race which might or might not match up with a nation was pretty nigh on impossible, certainly in, 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 in Western circles. However, that is to say, I don't, think I don't think there is no legacy at all. I think that both the anti-French and therefore anti-Enlightenment particularism of 19th century German thought and its sense of laws and forces determining our natures from Fichte through to Nietzsche and possibly beyond that to Heidegger, I think that continues to resonate, but not in the context of nationalism. I think it resonates in the context of identity politics. It resonates and gives an intellectual form to all those who wish to assert their freedom to be as their inner law of nature stroke culture, be one or two, dictates. And it resonates, I think, in those forms of cultural secession, these movements almost for cultural secession, say, be it from Catalonia to Quebec to Scotland, which seek to assert less their political nationhood, less to, less to assert their kind of... Uh, uh, a special form of political self-determination than their cultural distinctness and, no doubt, superiority. The legacy of the thought and thinking that underpinned German nationalism then continues to make its presence felt, but not on the far right. I think right, it makes its presence felt right here, I think, in the mainstream of identity politics. And that is the end.